This is undoubtedly the most miraculous mind-boggling mystery film in the history of cinema, and it's also the only film that gives away the entire plot and its title, because even if you know the entire story's content, unless you watch until the very last second, you still won't be able to guess who the true culprit is. This film is the masterpiece that crowns Agatha Christie, the queen of deduction, and then there were none. Without further ado, let's proceed and take a look together. This play truly depicts an incredibly captivating story. As the story begins, eight individuals from various parts of the world, mutually unfamiliar, simultaneously receive an invitation from a couple named Mr. and Mrs. Owen. This invitation calls upon them to attend a gathering at the villa on Mr. and Mrs. Owen's own small island. Among these eight individuals are a secretary, a nun, a police officer, a mercenary, a judge, a general, a wealthy person, and a doctor. As these eight individuals journey by boat to this secluded island, the ones receiving them are the two housekeepers of Mr. and Mrs. Owen. Not having personally encountered the couple themselves, however, at this moment, these eight people don't delve much into this matter. Subsequently, under the guidance of the housekeepers, they swiftly arrive at the interior of the villa, carrying a mix of excitement and curiosity, temporarily taking up residence. Little did they know, a dreadful murder game was awaiting, as they unknowingly stepped into it. Just as each individual returned to their respective rooms, the secretary discovered an odd nursery rhyme text on the wall. The content portrayed ten little soldiers running around for their meals, one choking to death, leaving nine soldiers behind. However, at this moment, the secretary didn't think much about it. Unbeknownst to them, each person's room had the same nursery rhyme text hanging, as if hinting at something. Shortly afterward, evening arrived swiftly. However, even by dinner time, the invited guests had yet to meet Mr. and Mrs. Owen. Confusion began to grow among them. What added to the Uranus was that when, the guests inquired with the butler about whether Mr. and Mrs. Owen had called with any messages, the butler surprised them by revealing there were no telephones in the villa. Any instructions from Mr. and Mrs. Owen were communicated through letters delivered by mail carriers, which meant that the people on the island were truly cut off from the outside world. Despite sensing an air of peculiarity in the invitation, the guests chose to accept it and resign themselves to the situation, especially since they were now stranded without a way to leave. Consequently, they began to speculate about the true identities of Mr. and Mrs. Owen. Just then, a mysterious voice abruptly emanated from the mansion's speakers. The enigmatic figure accused all of them of committing murder, including both the butler and the maid. However, as the bewildered looks exchanged among the guests, the butler admitted he had no knowledge of who the speaker might be. This revelation plunged the guests into complete dismay. Following this... They followed the sound to a room, only to discover that the voice was coming from a phonograph. In other words, it had been pre-recorded by someone. The question lingered, were the accusations of murder in the broadcast true or false? If all of it was real, wouldn't tonight turn into a gathering of murderers? Just the thought of it sent shivers down one's spine. Just then, the butler suddenly appeared with the fainted maid in his arms. Despite the skeptical gazes of the guests, the butler claimed that the maid had merely fainted from exhaustion. With that said, he carried the maid away, followed by the departure of the doctor. However, the maid had clearly been knocked out by the butler. Why would he intentionally lie? Could he be the mysterious Mr. Owen? Yet, the truth of the matter was far from being that simple. After returning to their room, the doctor gave the maid some medication, but the maid only dared to take it after seeing the butler nod in approval. Later, the maid lay on the bed trembling in fear, seemingly aware of some secret held by the butler, yet too afraid to voice it. After tending to the maid, the butler informed the others that he had no knowledge of the phonograph's content. He had simply followed Mr. and Mrs. Owen's instructions to play the record after dinner. Mr. and Mrs. Owen had mentioned in their letter that this was meant to be a surprise game for everyone. However, faced with these baseless accusations, the guests found this game far from enjoyable. Instead, they sensed a conspiracy lurking within. Could Mr. Owen have invited them here just to play such a trivial game? The answer was, of course, unlikely. Subsequently, the group began to discuss the victims mentioned in the broadcast. Some argued that it was blatant slander, while others claimed not to recognize any of the victims. However, in that moment, the hired mercenary, a captain, openly admitted to the accusations. He confessed that he had indeed brutally killed 21 villagers in an African tribe years ago. This revelation led the others to accuse him of being a butcher. Surprisingly, the captain calmly stated that perhaps he was the only one in the room telling the truth. He questioned the authenticity of the allegations against the others. He believed that as long as they didn't admit to the accusations, who could verify whether they were true or false? As the group prepared to continue their debate, 
the judge suddenly spoke up. He declared that arguing over such absurd accusations was pointless. He suggested that they return to their rooms, rest, and wait for the next day to leave the island. If they encountered Mr. and Mrs. Owen tomorrow, they could confront them directly. However, at this moment, the rich man remembered something. It turned out that the two people accused of being killed by him in the broadcast were the result of a drunken driving incident. He had unintentionally killed two children while driving under the influence. He tried to rationalize his actions, blaming the children for running onto the road. Nonchalantly, he took a sip of his drink as he spoke. Yet, in the next moment, the rich man's expression twisted into a grimace. He suddenly started coughing up blood. Amidst the horrified gazes of the others, he collapsed to the ground and died. This turn of events made everyone fully realize that this gathering was far from being as simple as they had imagined. The scene then shifted to the maid, who was currently having a nightmare. In her dream, she witnessed the butler killing an elderly person. Most crucially, that elderly person was the same victim, mentioned in the broadcast as having been killed by the butler. It was clear that this was not just a dream for the maid, and this was the reason why she was afraid of the butler. Following that, a series of knocks at the door startled the maid. Strangely, when she asked who was outside, she received no response. Soon, the morning of the second day arrived. The butler suddenly went to the doctor's door and informed him that something had happened at the villa. It turned out that the maid had inexplicably died in her room. After examining the body, the doctor confirmed that the maid's time of death was a few hours ago. So, who could have killed the maid? Could it be the butler? After all, he seemed to be the prime suspect at this point. After leaving the maid's room, the doctor coincidentally encountered the secretary, who had just woken up. The secretary mentioned that he had witnessed something strange in the living room. He led the doctor there and explained that on the dining table, where there had originally been... 10 small figurines. There were now inexplicably only 8. This perfectly corresponded to the 8 individuals still alive in the villa. The initial 10 people matched the 10 small soldiers, mentioned in the nursery rhyme. The secretary began to suspect that the nursery rhyme held a special meaning. However, the doctor believed that it was just a coincidence. But is this really the case in reality? Subsequently, during the meal, the secretary asked the others whether they had touched the soldier dolls. However, everyone stated that they hadn't. So, who could have taken the missing two dolls? Could it be the mysterious culprit who had never shown themselves? Meanwhile, the deaths of the rich man and the maid couldn't have been mere accidents either. The secretary believed that they might have been poisoned. The doctor was the last person to have contact with the maid, and he had even given her some tranquilizers. Therefore, the secretary suspected that the doctor might have killed the rich man and the maid. As an invited guest to the island, it seemed illogical for the doctor to carry a medical kit. After hearing the secretary's analysis, the others also began to suspect the doctor. To prove his innocence, the doctor allowed the others to inspect his medical kit. Inside, they found only mild tranquilizers. This indicated that the doctor wasn't involved in the maid's death. After a series of fruitless efforts, the group, with no leads to follow, had no choice but to wait at the villa on the island for the arrival of the boatman, regardless of who the culprit was or their motives. As long as they could safely leave the island, everything would come to an end. During the waiting period, the captain suspected that Owen who had invited them, must be hiding on this island. They just hadn't discovered it yet. After the captain and the police chief searched the entire island, they still didn't find any trace of anyone else. Meanwhile, on the other side, the general told the secretary that the boatman would never come, and no one would come to rescue them. This island was the end of their lives. However, the secretary had no idea what the general was talking about. She firmly believed that the boatman would come to take them away. After speaking, the secretary turned and left. However, not long after, the nun suddenly saw a large group of birds, hovering back and forth not far away. It seemed that something was beneath them. Curious, the nun approached to investigate, only to witness a chilling scene. The general, who had been alive just a moment ago, was now dead, apparently beaten to death by someone. The group then cooperatively brought back the general's body. The police chief immediately deduced from the wounds that it was a deliberate murder. But who was this mysterious killer? Other than themselves, there was no one else on the island. Could the killer be among them? However, before the group could make sense of the situation, the secretary, passing by the dining room, noticed that the original eight soldier figurines had turned into seven after the general's death. Now, apart from the secretary, no one believed that the killer was following the nursery rhyme to commit the murders. Meanwhile, inside the villa, there were continuous deaths happening one after another, forcing the group to gather and discuss who the real murderer was. However, the captain still believed that the killer was Owen, hidden somewhere on the island. On the contrary, the police chief argued that the more dangerous the situation became, the more important it was for everyone to maintain clear-headed rationality. He suggested that Owen might not even exist, but since they, eight complete strangers, were all invited to this island villa, 
There might be some common thread connecting them. It was even possible that someone among them knew all the others. To uncover the truth, they each began to recount their own situations. However, apart from being invited by Owen to come here, they didn't share any other commonalities. If there was any commonality, it was that they were all accused of committing murder. Yet, except for the captain and the wealthy man, none of the others admitted to having committed such a crime. At that moment, the judge suddenly noticed something. He realized that Owen's full name, when translated back, meant unknown, which appeared to be a riddle. Therefore, the judge also agreed with the captain's insistence, regardless of whether the mysterious killer was Owen or not, the person must be on this island, and more likely, among a group of people. Based on this deduction, the police chief believed that the killer was the butler. Right from the beginning, he had a feeling that the butler seemed suspicious. Other people also agreed with the police chief's speculation. The group had been waiting for the boatman to arrive, but since they hadn't seen him, they had no choice but to return to their rooms to sleep. Just after midnight, they heard the doctor banging a gong downstairs. It turned out that the doctor had woken up to find something to eat and accidentally discovered the butler's body in the kitchen. With his abdomen split open, the gruesome scene caused the secretary, who saw it directly, to vomit on the spot. With the butler's gruesome death, it indicated that the mysterious killer wasn't him. At the same time, the butler's death perfectly matched two lines from the nursery rhyme. Chop in half, life ends, seven becomes six. Currently, there were only six survivors left, just as the rhyme described. It was only at this moment that the doctor realized the secretary's speculations had been correct all along. The killer was indeed following the deaths of the ten little soldiers described in the nursery rhyme, which meant that everyone present would die. After learning the truth, the doctor was completely shattered by fear. After all, facing unknown terror is an instinct inherent in humans from birth. However, shortly after the discovery of the butler's death, the secretary entered the dining room and was surprised to find that out of the six little soldier figurines originally on the table, only five remained. Without a doubt, another person had died. The secretary quickly banged the gong to alert the others, and they indeed found that the nun had been brutally stabbed to death in her room. This matched the description of six little soldiers in the nursery rhyme, play with the beehive, anger the bees, a wasp flies in, a life is lost. Six becomes five. Despite everyone knowing that the killer was following the nursery rhyme to commit the murders, they felt helpless. No one knew who the next victim would be. Soon after handling the butler's body, the captain returned to his room and discovered that his gun was missing. It was clear that someone had broken into his room, but who could this person be? And what puzzled the captain even more was how they entered without leaving any trace. Considering the room was locked, the captain suspected that someone had a master key that could open all the doors, and the most likely candidate was the butler. Coincidentally, the one who discovered the butler's body was the doctor. Therefore, the captain believed the doctor stole his gun. However, the doctor argued that all of this was just the captain's personal speculation. After all, no one could confirm if the master key really existed. The doctor added that the stolen gun might be nothing more than a fabrication by the captain, perhaps a part of a scheme he was orchestrating. He might even be the actual killer of the others. This immediately sparked a dispute between the two sides. However, at this moment, the sheriff suddenly stepped forward to support the doctor's statement. Unexpectedly, the captain turned his accusations towards the sheriff, questioning why he lingered in the butler's room for a long time after handling the butler's body. Could it be that he took the key from the butler at that time and used it to open his room to steal the gun? Despite the dire situation, the group couldn't resist internal conflicts. It must be said that they were quite audacious to engage in this while a crisis loomed over them. However, all these were just individual speculations with no substantive evidence. Everyone present could potentially be the suspect who took the key and the gun. To uncover the truth, they collectively searched every person's room. Yet, they couldn't find the missing gun in anyone's room. With that being the case, where did the vanished gun end up? Could it be that the culprit wasn't among the five of them? After a fruitless search, the now composed captain began to suspect that the judge might be the killer. During his tenure, the judge not only favored giving death sentences to criminals but he also attended the executions of those he condemned. This meant that the judge, like the killer, enjoyed the same pleasure from causing death. However, the secretary didn't seem interested in participating in the discussion between the captain and the others. Instead, she turned to return to her room to rest. But shortly after she left, a terrifying scream echoed from her room. When the captain and the others rushed over, they found the secretary had already fainted. With the doctor's assistance, the secretary quickly regained consciousness. According to her, she thought someone was in her room, which frightened her into unconsciousness. The group didn't think much of it and moved on. However, at that moment, the doctor suddenly realized that the judge was absent from the scene after hearing the secretary scream. Realizing something was amiss, the group hurried to the study, only to discover that the judge had been brutally murdered by the killer. This meant that the captain's previous speculations were all wrong. The judge couldn't possibly be the killer. The cause of the judge's death was a gunshot wound 
and the murder weapon was the same missing gun the captain had lost earlier. Then the scene shifts, the four individuals enter the dining room, and see that out of the original ten little soldiers on the table, only four remain. It corresponds to the four of them, who will be the next victim, under immense psychological torment. They don't know if they'll see the sun tomorrow. They decide to indulge themselves tonight, savoring these last moments. However, after the revelry, they will inevitably have to confront reality. After the four retire to their rooms once again, not much time passes before the sheriff seems to hear something outside the door. Cautiously, he opens the door to check and sees that the doctor has secretly left the villa. Witnessing this, the sheriff instantly realizes that the doctor is the murderer. He quickly finds the captain and informs him, only to discover that the captain and the secretary are together. However, the sheriff doesn't have time to care about this at the moment. He grabs the captain and heads in the direction the doctor left. They search all night but can't find any trace of the doctor. What's even more peculiar is that when the captain returns to his room, he finds his lost gun on the bed. This leaves the captain puzzled. How did the killer manage to do all of this unnoticed? When the captain tells the sheriff and the secretary about this, the sheriff unexpectedly suggests that perhaps the captain's gun was never lost. Maybe after committing the murders, he secretly placed the gun on his bed last night to divert suspicion from himself. Alternatively, after they left last night, the secretary might have secretly put the gun back in the room for the captain. After all, they are together now, and who knows if they might team up against the sheriff. What's even more crucial is that, when they were searching for the doctor's trail last night, the sheriff and the captain were separated. Thus, the sheriff even suspects that maybe the doctor's sudden disappearance was due to the captain secretly killing him last night. However, just as the two are arguing, the secretary suddenly states that the doctor is still alive. He's been playing us off each other from the start. And he's still alive because people don't just vanish. Not on an island this side. He's still alive. So, the secretary believes that the doctor is the murderer. On such a small island, a living person can't just disappear into thin air. However, the actual truth is far from being as simple as imagined. Watching others die one by one in mysterious ways, the sheriff, unable to withstand the mental torment, finally confesses his own truth. The broken sheriff trembles as he reveals that the accusations against him in the record are all true. He indeed personally killed an innocent criminal. Back then, a small-time crook was apprehended, but the sheriff, who was supposed to release him, unexpectedly, due to his personal reasons, brutally murdered, and dismembered the small-time crook, covering up all the truth in the end. Now, at this point in the plot, can we infer that the ten people invited here are actually all guilty of the murders they were accused of, and the so-called elusive mysterious killer is, in fact, just asserting justice in their own way? The answer to this point will be revealed later. Returning to the plot, after listening to the sheriff's confession, the captain and the secretary don't feel surprised. After all, the most important thing now is how to leave here alive. Subsequently, the composed sheriff, based on years of investigative experience, speculates that they are currently being monitored by someone, which is why the killer knows their every move. Therefore, the three of them decide to pack their belongings and leave the villa, heading to the seaside to see if they can come across any passing ships. However, as the captain and the secretary depart, the sheriff, unexpectedly, remains alone in the villa, deluding himself into trying to identify that dreadful murderer. Meanwhile, on the other side, the captain and the secretary arrived at the seaside, only to suddenly realize that the sheriff hadn't followed them out. Helpless, the captain had to return to the villa once again. However, upon returning, he witnessed a spine-chilling scene. Before he could process it fully, the secretary, who had noticed his prolonged absence, also came back. Yes, soldier boy. What can you do? A big bear had one and then there were two. In just an instant, the sheriff had already been brutally murdered. Now... Out of the original ten people, only the captain and the secretary remained, along with the missing doctor. Could it be that the mysterious killer was indeed the doctor? However, as the secretary and the captain returned to the seaside once again, the secretary unintentionally noticed something on the desert below. They cautiously went down to investigate, only to discover the lifeless body of the missing doctor. With this, the possibility of the doctor being the killer was ruled out. Now... Only the secretary and the captain were left on the island. Who among them was the actual murderer? No one knew. But in the eyes of the secretary, the mysterious killer was the captain. So, while the captain was preparing to deal with the doctor's body, the secretary secretly took the pistol he had behind him, stating that she knew the captain intended to kill her. However, the captain denied harboring any murderous intentions, claiming that the real killer was someone else entirely, and that this person must be on the island. No one else! You killed them all! Listen to me, we're Right now we're being hunted. I need the gun. Give it to me. And so, 
The captain was brutally beaten to death by the secretary. The secretary became the sole survivor on the island. But the story didn't end here, the truth was still concealed. The true twist was just beginning. After killing the captain, the secretary returned alone to the villa's room. However, at this moment, a new suddenly appeared on the ceiling. The secretary realized that it was prepared for her by the killer. Knowing she had no way out, she hesitated no more and placed her head into the noose. But just then, the room door suddenly swung open, revealing the unexpected presence of the deceased judge. Only at this moment did the truth surface completely. It turned out that the captain's speculation was correct. The puppeteer behind everything was indeed the judge. The judge's ability to feign his own death was possible due to the constant help of the doctor who was kept in the dark. The doctor sought an alliance with the judge, thinking they could escape together. Little did he know, this encounter led to his own demise. Upon discovering the truth, the secretary couldn't fathom why the judge had done all this. The judge explained that he invited everyone to the island in Owen's name because he indeed enjoyed the thrill of these killings. Another reason was that all the invited people were guilty of murder. Only the sheriff, the captain, and the wealthy man had admitted their guilt. Among them, the doctor concealed his inability to perform surgeries, leading to a fatal mistake during a significant surgery, causing an innocent person's death. The nun turned a blind eye to the pleas for help from her pregnant maid, and indirectly caused her death. As for the secretary, she was once a young boy's teacher, and fell in love with his uncle. To secure her lover's inheritance, she callously drowned the young boy, who was the rightful heir. While these accusations were true, there was no evidence to prove them. Hence, these individuals managed to escape legal consequences. Yet, in the judge's eyes, good and evil would eventually be accounted for. The secretary and the others had to pay a hefty price for their crimes. Learning that his time was running out, the judge devised a perfect slaughter game to send these criminals to the abyss. However, as of now, the secretary seemed unrepentant for her deeds. She pleaded with the judge to spare her, suggesting they could shift the blame for all the deaths to the deceased captain. This way, they could both evade legal consequences, but the judge couldn't allow such absurdity. Without waiting for more words, he decisively pulled away the stool from under the secretary's feet. As she hung there, the film concluded with the judge, who upheld and violated the law, removing all evidence and then choosing to end his own life. This dreadful murder case became an everlasting mystery, with Owen, the one who invited them to the island, being non-existent, and the judge's death, no one would ever know who had killed everyone.